Hello everyone, my name is Alfonso Amberzone, and today's session is on monitoring and diagnostics, where I will talk about our single or composite online transformer gas monitors. Okay, before we talk about the monitors themselves, I want to just briefly touch a little bit on dissolved gases and moisture, because many people wonder where the gases or the moisture actually comes from. This is a typical oil molecule. When this oil molecule degrades, it starts to break apart. And as it breaks apart, it produces gases, hydrocarbons. And the hydrocarbons it produces is hydrogen, methane, ethylene, acetylene, ethane. And as you can see, there's a lot of hydrogen molecules that are produced. So hydrogen is the primary gas that's developed when an oil molecule breaks down. This chart shows how that occurs. So the hydrogen gas is a gas that develops at very low temperatures. The x-axis here below, it represents the temperature of the fault within the main tank. So at very low temperatures, hydrogen is produced. And as the temperature of the fault increases, the hydrogen increases. And then the development of other gases starts to appear as well. As you can see, acetylene only starts to appear in the oil at high temperatures. And what usually causes a high temperature around 1,000 degrees is usually an arcing. So when you have arcing, you'll have acetylene. So depending on the type of gases that are generated, the concentration of the gases that are generated, you can start to have an understanding of what kind of a breakdown you're actually having in the main tank. So the gases in relation to concentration and how they are occurring can tell you a lot of what, what's going on in the main tank. The other gases that are developed are through the insulation, the paper. This is a cellulosis bond, a paper bond. And watch what happens when this paper bond starts to deteriorate. Okay? It starts to break apart and you start seeing gas molecules forming. The predominant gas molecule that's formed is CO followed by CO2. However, you also see water generated. That's correct. When we talk moisture, moisture is generated through the paper. The insulation that wraps around the windings, the insulation that wraps around the core generates water. So, oil breaks down, you have gases that are generated in the form of hydrogen, ethylene, ethane, methane, acetylene. The paper degrades or starts to uh, decompose, you start seeing increase of carbon monoxide increase of carbon dioxide and an increase of water. Here's a breakdown of the CO2 in relation to temperature. It does not take a lot of temperature to start breaking down the paper. Okay, Depending on the type of paper you have, they all have a rated hotspot and the rated hotspots of paper usually run between 95 to 110 degrees. So it will not take a very high temperature fault to start degrading the paper. So anything below 95 degrees, the paper will not be too affected. But anything generated above the 95 degrees Celsius, then you'll start to generate the paper and the gases will start to be produced. Again, the predominant gases here, CO, CO2, and moisture. So let's have a look at this moisture. People say, well, how can that be? Well, he, here's, here are two pie charts. The pie chart on the left represents the distribution of insulation. So when we look at a transformer, 90% of the insulation in a transformer is oil, and only 10% is the paper. However, when you look at the relationship of the water distribution, you see that 99% of the water is actually in the paper and less than 1% is actually in the oil. So there's where the water comes from. A, a breakdown of the paper bonds will generate moisture. 
Is moisture critical? Absolutely. Breakdown of paper generates moisture. Breakdown of paper weakens the dielectrical strength of the paper. Weakening the dielectrical strength of the paper, you start causing short circuits. Causing short circuits leads to partial discharge and will eventually lead to the aging of the transformer. So the aging of the transformer is directly related to the health of the paper. And this is why monitoring hot spots, monitoring the moisture in the oil is a critical part of transformer monitoring. Here's a graph that was taken uh, using one of our products, the Hydrine M2, um, with uh, monitoring top oil using the Hydrine M2 as well. And you see the relationship here between the oil temperature and the water. So as the oil temperature increases, you start to affect the paper, and then and, and by affecting the paper, the paper will start to break down, will start generating and releasing water molecules. That water molecule will go into the oil, and that's where we measure the, the, the water. And consequently, when the temperature of the oil cools down, that water then goes back into the paper. So as long as the paper stays healthy, healthy, it will release water and it will take the water back in when it has to. But as the paper degrades over time, it will no longer be able to hold that water and then eventually that water will simply migrate more and more into the oil causing all sorts of other problems. Hey, this is why it's very important to monitor the moisture in the oil. All right, so now we're going to start talking a little bit about the single gas or a composite gas products. And when I talk about the single or composite gas product, I'm talking about the hydran technology. Okay, the hydran technology is a composite technology. And I'll explain to you what all of this means. We have two, two products, the hydran 201Ti, Usually I refer to TI, so in this presentation, if I refer to TI, I mean the 201, and the Hydran M2. Here you see a photograph of both sensors. You can see a drastic difference between the both sensors, and I'll explain to you why there's a difference between the overall physical dimension of the sensor. But the actual detection, the gas detection portion of both these sensors is exactly the same. Okay, the only thing that changes is that the M2 does a little bit more. So, how does the hydran technology work? So, the gases are generated in the transformer and they break down and you have hydrogen, CO, acetylene and ethylene and all the other gases as, 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 uh, as well as, as moisture. So, I'm just going to blow this up. So, the hydrogen technology is based on an electrochemical detector or microfuel cell. And the detector that you see here, that I, it's in a red circle, is inside that brass cavity. So, the slide before I showed you the, the two physical sensors, this gas detector, electrochemical detector, is inside those casings. In the front of the detector, we have a filter that's, that has a membrane stuck to it or laminated onto the, the filter. The membrane, what the membrane does, it allows the gas molecules to penetrate and go through and come in and go into the detector. Okay? It does not allow the oil to penetrate through. 
However, if someone were to cut or deform the membrane, then you will have oil penetrate the cavity and it will saturate the electrochemical device or the, elect the microfuel cell. And when that, this cell is saturated with oil, it no longer works, it's dead, okay? So do not, in any circumstance, try to cut or deform the membrane because that's, that, that, that's there for a reason. And what happens is the, the gas molecules penetrate the membrane, come into contact with the microfuel cell. The microfuel cell has two electrodes, positive and a negative. We drop a resistor across it. So what, well, there's a potential difference between, when there's a potential di difference between the two electrodes, a current is generated. That current is amplified through an amplifier and gives us a millivolt signal. And that millivolt signal is directly proportional to the amount of concentration of the dissolved gases that are in the oil. And this is the hydrant technology gas phase. Okay? So very simple. And for those who are wondering what the O2 is, on the back of all the hydrant sensors, whether it is the TI sensor or the M2 sensor, we have a small pinhole that allows oxygen to come in, and that oxygen fuels the electrochemical reaction, just like starting a fire. A fire will not start if there's no oxygen. Sensor calibration. All the sensors, once they are built, go through a couple of steps. So the sensors are physically built. The brass piece is physically built and goes through preliminary gas phase test. So we inject uh, hydrogen gas to make sure that all the materials are put together properly. Once that is done, they all go onto what we call oil calibration loops. And these loops bundle a batch of 50 sensors as a 50 sensors at a time. And on this loop, we, we, we change the temperature of the oil and the concentration of the oil, and we take, and we have several sampling points where we, we, we look at the calibration of each point for each sensor. And all of this data is then brought into a microprocessor, and it's all compiled through a microprocessor. Every single sensor manufacturer goes through this process. This process takes 300 hours or approximately two weeks. All the gas sensors, the TI and the M2 sensors go through its calibration process. The M2 has an extra step to it, whereas the M2 goes, also goes through a humidity verification because we measure also humidity with um, humidity in the oil um, with our M2 sensor that it goes, it then goes into a humidity chamber and it's verified at different humidity levels. Each sensor that's manufactured at the factory comes with its, its own specific data sheet, or I call this a, a, a birth certificate, okay? And every sensor has its own birth certificate and every sensor is different. So on this specific sheet, this is a, an M2 sheet, um, so what, what you'll see on here is you'll see the customer name, you'll see the serial number, and you'll see what options the unit will have, uh, particularly on the M2 because it is, has expandable monitoring capabilities, which I'll go through later on. Uh, we indicate what those expandable monitoring capabilities are, and then we have the calibration parameters. So an M2 data sheet will show the gas parameters and will show the uh, moisture parameters. Um, a TI gas uh, sensor data sheet will only show the gas parameters. Okay, very, very straightforward. Every unit comes with these data sheets. Even if you replace a sensor on site, you order a new sensor, the new sensor will come with its own data sheet and you must enter all the calibration parameters in the CPU prior to uh, turning up prior to having a good measurement. Now I'll talk to you about another feature of the hydrogen technology, what we call a dynamic oil sampling or DOS, okay? Not a pr computer program. It's actually what I call a, um, a built-in thermal conditioning unit, 
okay? And you'll probably see that in some of our, ma our latest manuals. Uh, we no longer talk about dynamic hose sampling, but we talk more of thermal conditioning unit. It's built in and it's automated. Before I talk about the DOS system, I want to talk a little bit about installation because this is a topic where a lot of questions usually arise from. Where do I install my hydrogen unit? And, and the, the answer is very simple. Wherever there's a transformer, you can install a hydrogen unit because a hydrogen unit, its, it's, it's, it's fundamental principle, it was designed with no added tubes, uh, gas lines, pumps, nothing, nothing outside of the ordinary other than a screw type and MPT mounting hardware that goes directly onto a transformer valve. Okay? Now, we do have locations that are better than others. The best place to put a hydrant sensor is where there, there's a most circulation of oil. And where's that? Usually at, at, the, at the end of the cooling system underneath the radiators or on the other side of the pump where the, the oil is taken from the cooling system and brought back into the transformer main tank. That's the freshest oil. That's the best place. But not necessarily you have a valve there. The next best place will be on the top, top portions of the transformer. This is much hotter than the bottom. So where, it, where it's hotter, oils will tend to move more quickly. A very good location. However, 85% of our installations worldwide are actually here at item number four, which happens to be the drain valve. Why are 85% of our locations installations located there? Because there's always a drain valve on a transformer, and it's the most accessible uh, valve on the transformer. These valves up here are not technically or potentially accessible. Some of these valves, especially this one here, number two, the top filling valve, okay, could be high enough that a person may not be allowed to install the hydrogen unit on a live transformer, so now you require a shutdown. Whereas if you use a drain valve, you don't require to shut down the transformer because there's no danger of installing the hydrogen down here when the transformer is in operation. Now, many people ask me, will I be able to see a fault if I'm connected at the drain valve? And the answer is yes. Yes, because the oil naturally flows through the transformer. So a fault happening on one side of the transformer will eventually make it all the way through the transformer, dissolved in the gas, in the oil. Okay, the gases get dissolved in the oil, and it'll eventually get picked up by the hydran unit. So again, there are better locations than others, but sometimes using the location that suits the best is better than not using a location at all. DOS, how do we make the DOS effective? To make the DOS effective, installation is critical. Keeping the shortest distance between the hydrant sensor and the main body of oil is critical. As I just explained, oil moves naturally in the transformer. It will naturally come into, in, inside the valve here, come in contact with the sensor, and because there's a differential temperature change here, will move out to ensure that we move the oil even faster in front of the sensor, we have what we call our DOS effect. And the DOS is simply this. We have a, a heating system built right here on what we call the base plate. This is the base plate where the sensor sits. This is heated upon power up and heated very quickly. Lots of power to get the sensor up to temperature very quickly. We maintain the sensor temperature at 35 degrees. So the minute you turn on the unit, put power to it, the heaters go into, into operation and start heating up the sensor as quickly as possible. So in very cold days, this heater can get very hot to the point where you cannot even touch it, okay? But well, once the sensor gets up to temperature, then the heaters will start to shut off. And they'll shut off and on, off and on, on a regular basis. We call that temperature modulation. 
and that extra temperature modulation ensures us that any oil in front of the sensor will get evacuated and moved out quickly. Okay? So this is what a typical uh, DOS dynamic oil sampling graph looks like. So we modulate this temperature above the sensor, temp uh, above the sensor set point, 5 degrees above is 5 degrees below. So if everything's working normally, you should get a nice beautiful waveform in this fashion. If the oil temperature is at 90 degrees, you probably won't get a, a, a waveform of this. You'll probably just get a straight line up over the 50, 60 degree mark, which is still okay. The heating doesn't come on if the oil temperature and the sensor are very hot. The, oil temp the dynamic oil sampling comes on when the oil temperature is very close to the sensor temperature, allowing it to, to, to move faster. Okay? So, does it work? Does this DOS system work? Yes, it does work. And I'll show you how it works. Assuming the transformer is cold, the oil is cold, the heaters on, this, on the heating system will go get into action because as the, as the oil comes into con contact with the sensor, it will cool down the sensor. So right away the heater goes on, starts to heat. And when, it, when that occurs, you will have the oil flowing in one direction. Okay? Now, we proved this. We had this proven by a third-party laboratory. So we sent... Um, we put together um, a system where we had a huge tank. Um, that tank was under pressure, just like a transformer, and we're able to cool down the tank, the oil in the tank, and warm up the oil in the tank. And at the end of the, the of the of the tube, we put a, a a valve with one of our units on it. And this clearly shows when the oil's cold and the sensor's hot, the oil moves in a specific direction. If we reverse that and we warm up the oil to the point where it comes in contact with the sensor and warms up the sensor above the set point, then the heaters don't come on and therefore the sensor side will be cooler than the oil side and the oil will move in the opposite direction. And this was again proven. The tank oil warm, warming up, coming into contact with the sensor that's at 35 degrees will cool down the oil, will not allow uh, the heaters to come on, so there's already a differential temperature change here, the oil will move in the opposite direction. So we have proven, proven that our DOS, an internal uh, thermal conditioning system, does work and is effective, and the way to keep it effective is to keep the, scent, the distance between the sensor and the main body of oil as short as possible. Now, we could also have situations where the oil temperature is at the same temperature of the sensor. That could happen, especially if the oil temperature is only running at 35, 40 degrees. Eventually, the sensor and the oil temperature will be exactly at the same temperature. When this occurs, there's no oil movement. When there's no oil movement, there's no exchange of gas molecules. When there's no exchange of gas molecules, the reading goes down to zero. However, because the heaters are always on, whenever the temperature is the same, it's for a very small fraction nanosecond, millisecond, that is insignificant to the entire reading of the hydrant sensor. And even if somebody were to shut down this valve and the gas, there's no more oil circulation and the, the sensors are, are, are consumed, the reading will slowly come down because we do have an electronic filter that's built in to slow down the progression of, of the, uh, the dip in the event that um, we do have a stagnant oil circulation uh, situation, okay?
So now let me talk about the products. We're going to go right into the products now. And the two products that I'm going to talk about is the 201TI and the Hydran M2. These are what we call our single composite uh, instruments. So the TI, it's an online dissolved gas transformer monitoring device. It reacts to a development or a change of gases in the oil. It is not an analyzer. It will not measure the individual gas concentrations of the gases. It will just measure the gases. It will display a value. And if there's a change, it will tell you. So the way to use this monitor, the best way to use this monitor, is, a, is as a trending device. So on the right hand side, you see the monitor. You see the front end of the monitor. There's a two line display. So on the display, we're always showing the le gas level, uh, the date and time. We're showing the trending level, whether it be a 24 hour trending or a 30 day trending. And the back side here is what gets mounted on the transformer valve. Now, I, re I refer to this as a composite value or a single value, okay, because that's what it is. It the the, the uh, chemical electrochemical detector, the micro fuel cell, reacts to these four gases. However, the sensitivity to these four gases is different. It's 100% sensitive to hydrogen, between 15 and 18% sensitive to CO, 1.5% sensitive to, sensitive to ethylene, and 8% sensitive to acetylene. So basically. Um, in order for it just to read acetylene, you have to have a lot of acetylene. The temperature fault needs to be close to 1,000 degrees. And by the time you get to 1,000 degrees, you will have already generated enough hydrogen that you should get an alarm. So it is basically a hydrogen monitor, CO monitor, primarily. So. This would be um, an evolution of gas. This is a typical trending device where the unit is turned on, it's trending very normally, nothing's happening, and then all of a sudden, bang, you get a big spike. So by using this instrument as a trending device, you can set up the alarms to have a one sudden spike telling you there's been a big change, or you can set up the trending alarms either uh, a daily trending based on an hourly change or uh, a monthly change based on days change and by those by monitoring that rate of change you can be alerted ahead of time uh, prior to something uh, spectacular happening in in your transformer so the unit was launched in 1994 uh, there's over 40,000 of them installed worldwide today um, it is the predecessor to the analog version, so the TI stands for intelligent uh, because it's microprocessor based, it has a display, it has a keypad. You don't, you don't need a, um, um, a computer to actually um, to set it up. Um, just using the keypad, it can easily be set up. Uh, however, you do need a computer to download it. Uh, you don't have to download every day. It, it does have memory capability up to three months. Uh, we store everything from short-term, long-term events, service alarms, anything that happens to the unit is stored. Um, it has relays for low, high, and system. Um, it has a standard analog output. Um, it has a... Um, Hydran protocol, but our newer versions today also have the Modbus protocol. Um, we have a local USB port where you, you, you can download. Um, and again, it can, it can communicate um, with our multi-host software or our uh, perception uh, desktop uh, software. Um, we do have our older versions uh, don't have the Modbus protocol, but all our newer versions today uh, with the blue logo on the side means that um, uh, it is a Modbus, has Modbus capability. So if you want to take the registers to a SCADA system, 
uh, you have the capability. So the other enhancements that, that we've done with the unit is uh, we've been able to uh, not only give it the uh, Modbus protocol, but we've been able to enhance its 485 capability where, where now you can actually daisy chain uh, units to, together um, um, uh, to be able to, to monitor them uh, locally on one PC. So if you, if you have a bank of three transformers and you have one on each transformer and a techn technical guy goes there locally every month with his laptop to download, he, he doesn't have to go to the individual ones if they're all connected together from, from one of them. He can look at all, all of them. Um, and the, the other thing as well that we have is we have some accessories uh, that go with this uh, with these equipment. Uh, we have two controllers. We have what we call a CI1 controller and the CI1 controller is an extension of the TI. So if you have a, a TI that's mounted on the upper filling valve, you can't see the display, very hard to look at it, uh, you, can, you can bring that signal back to a CI1 controller and you have a local dis display of the PPM and only the PPM. Uh, you have the alarm lights and again all the relays, communication options are all in this box. So you don't have to wire up the TI, you can wire everything up here in this box. The only thing that this box will not give you on the display will not give you the trend in the display. It just shows you um, the, um, um, the PPM level. And the other controller that we have is our uh, CIC controller. Uh, this is simply a communication controller. allows you to network uh, four TIs together so you can actually bring in four TIs in here and then f from here you can do your, your remote where your remote communication back to the control room. It has no display, no memory, nothing whatsoever. One of the options that we have um, is our heat fin adapter. This heat fin adapter is not only for the TI, but is also for the M2. And we specifically recommend uh, this, um, this heat fin adapter uh, in conditions where we know we're going into hot tropical areas. Uh, we know the oil temperature is going to be in excess of 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, we recommend uh, this, that this uh, heat fin adapter be put in place. This heat fin adapter will significantly cool down the oil up to 15 degrees. Um, and, and doing that will aid and extend the life of the sensor. Uh, the life of the hydrant sensor is, is basically under normal working operating conditions can go anywhere between five to ten years. Um, uh, however, if, if the operating conditions are abused, uh, specifically regarding temperature, oil temperature, um, you can degrade its life and, and have uh, less of a life. So using a heat fin adapter is the way to go. All right, let's have a look at the Hydran M2 now. The Hydran M2 does both dissolve gases and moisture, so it encompasses what we call a dual sensor. It also has the ability to do more transformer monitoring, so we can turn the Hydran M2 from a dissolve and moisture gas unit into a mini transformer monitoring system. Here is a look at the dual sensor. Uh, so it's based on a hydrant technology for the gas measurement. So we have the membrane um, where the gas molecules per permeate through the membrane, come in contact with the detector in the back and we do the gas measurement. 
and encompassed right here in the housing is the moisture sensor where the moisture in the oil is measured. Our moisture sensor is based on a capacitor. So when uh, moisture comes in contact with this capacitor, it changes the frequency or the oscillation of the capacitor. And that direct change in capacitance and oscillation is directly related uh, to the, the amount of, of moisture in the oil. And we represent that on the display as relative humidity and as uh, a PPM level. So customer has both views, percent relative humidity and PPM content. Here's a, a look at the Hydran M2 from the back side, uh, where we see the brass sensor um, that gets mounted onto the transformer valve. And on the brass sensor, we also have what we call um, um, a port. That port is used to purge the unit during installation, but also a port is also used to take an oil sample using a syringe. You'll also see uh, some stickers here on the front. Uh, one sticker talks about the serial number and the power consumption and the other and the other sticker talks about the different options that may come with the unit. Um, and this is the heating plate or the base plate. This is where the, the resistors are mounted so for the thermal conditioning uh, system to take to take effect or the DOS to take effect. On the interior, once you remove the cover, we have a display with a keypad, the display uh, can show up to eight li lines of information um, and the keypad allows you to make all sorts of changes so if, if you don't have a laptop or your laptop uh, has run out of batteries uh, no worries you can use the the local uh, keypad and the display to look at the different um, screens and change stuff and so on and so forth uh, we have connections for alarms so there are five type five relays uh, that I'll talk about a little later um, and, and again, the simplicity of the hydrant technology um, is uh, the fact that it's single mount, uh, single valve mount. Um, and here's a typical installation. Um, the, the reason why this one has a lot of cables going to it is probably because this is an instrument that is fully loaded uh, with analog and digital input cards uh, to be able to do the extra stuff. Uh, such as top oil measurement, bottle, uh, bottom oil measurement, um, uh, winding uh, current, and, and to be able to do all the transformer models such as winding hotspot, uh, insulation aging, and so forth. Product specification features. So, uh, the Hydran M2. It looks at moisture in the oil, so we're looking at a 0 to 100% relative humidity. And that humidity that's being me measured is also calculated back into a PPM level for customers who are used to looking at PPM. And then we do the composite gas measurement uh, where we look at the, the hydrogen, CO, acetylene, and ethylene. And again, it has their different concentrations. And the accuracy of the unit is a plus or minus 10 percent, plus or minus 25 ppm for the hydrogen measurement because it is 100 percent sensitive to hydrogen, and on the moisture side, it's plus or minus 2 percent. So here's the here's the analog um, relays. Um, uh, sorry, the digital relays. Uh, so these are the di uh, relays going out. So there's two relays for um, for the gas monitor. There's two relays for the moisture monitor, and there's there's a system failure. So on on the gas and on the moisture, um, you can have low um, and high. Uh, you can have, uh, and that's either on levels, direct levels, or on trending. Okay, remember as I said earlier, uh, the hydrants are usually used as a trending device uh, because you can you can set alarms on based on trends that can take place on 24 hours or trends that can take place uh, on a 30-day period. So you, you can adjust those trends and not wait until there's a large increase in gas before you trigger an alarm. Um, the Hydran M2 is more powerful as well when it comes to communication options. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can communicate to it. Uh, there's local RS-485, local RS-232. We can 
put in a modem card. We can put in an Ethernet card. We also have a fiber module that we can incorporate directly inside the module, and, and, and it's covered with, with, with the cover, and that fiber module is a fiber over Ethernet. Um, we have different types of um, protocols. We have DMP3 Modbus that are standard on the unit. Um, we could have the unit on a Hydram protocol. If you have older systems that are running on a Hydram protocol, we can do that as well. Um, if you require uh, IC61850, uh, we can do that as well as done using an external device. And of course, it's expandability. Uh, like I said, we can do analog inputs, we can do digital inputs, we can do analog outputs, we can do a combination of all three, as long as they don't go more than four, because we only have four slots. And again, uh, by doing analog inputs, this gives you the capability of doing more monitoring, as I was saying, uh, running transformer models. So uh, going, from a very uh, going from a very simplistic device to a more sophisticated device. It has a, a very powerful built-in microprocessor. Um, so um, everything's done at the unit, stored at the unit, uh, up to three months typically of data storage, and then first in, first out. Um, so you don't have to download on a regular basis. Um, um, you can leave the unit running and download it once a week, once a month. Uh, the idea is not to forget to download because eventually uh, the memory will um, start start uh, start start losing the the, the first um, few events that have occurred. So so we log everything. Uh, we log service data, alarm data, um, whatever uh, um, is done by the unit. It, it is logged. Heat fin adapter. Um, again, we highly recommend this in very warm, hot countries or in applications where the oil temperature exceeds the 40 degrees and is up in the 50s and the 60s, this will only help prolong the life of our sensor. A sensor does directly affect the life of the hydrant sensor. So how do we correlate the composite PPM value uh, to, a, to a DGA, okay? Um, first and foremost, what we ask customers whenever we're correlating data is try to take the oil sample at the sensor. Here's a photograph of a, a H201TI sensor where an oil sample is being taken just after installation and then the electronic goes over the top. On the Hydran M2, you don't have to worry about removing the electronics as this port is external so you can just remove the oil very simply. Um, and if you have a our portable unit to transport 10, uh, within 20 minutes you have a DGA result, meaning that you have a, a reading of all the individual gases. Um, if you don't have a transport 10 and you have many hydrans, uh, it's recommended that, 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 that one is invested in because it really does help understand a situation very quickly should a hydran go into alarm. Um, if you have to rely on a laboratory result, sometimes those laboratory results can take up to a day uh, to get the results back, and sometimes you don't have a day depending on how catastrophic the fault could be within the main tank. So let's have a look how the readings are correlated. So assuming that the reading is 200 ppm on the display, uh, that's the sensitivity of the sensor. You do a DGA either using a transport tan or going to the laboratory, you'll get a reading back of all the individual gases. The four gases that we pay attention to are these four right here, the hydrogen and CO being the primary two gases that we focus on. Okay, we multiply the DGA results by the sensitivity to get a calculated hydrogen reading. So then we compare that calculated hydrogen reading with the true reading that's on the display. And to do that, you must take in, into consideration the accuracy of the unit being plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 25 ppm for the hydrogen reading because it's 100% sensitive to hydrogen and there is a tolerance on a hydrogen reading. So if the calculated hydrogen reading falls within this total range, 
then we say that the hydrant reading is good. Okay, again, remember, this is a trending device. It's to tell you there's been a change in your transformer. It is not an analyzer. If you want a specific analyzer to see the individual gases, then you must purchase the online multi-gas instrument. This is simply a device to tell you something has gone wrong. Take action. Like I said, the M2 is expandable, uh, so you can take uh, some uh, raw data from the transformer, uh, transformer characteristics. Uh, we can run um, algorithms based on IEEE and IEC directly in the unit uh, to give you a simple, simplified uh, representation of what's um, going on inside the transformer main tank. And this is what we call transformer models, taking raw data and turning them into something valuable. So here's a, um, how, how it's done. So uh, up in the right-hand corner, you actually see a live photograph of a hydrogen N2 mounted on the top valve. Uh, you see the magnetically mounted RTD. Um, and this is, this is our sensors that come back into the unit. So again, depending on, on what sensors are brought back to the unit, um, as long as it's not more than four, because uh, we only have four slots, uh, we can run different transformer models. So you can turn this inexpensive... Uh, dissolve gas and moisture monitor into a comprehensive mini uh, transformer system very very easily. So the takeaways and benefits of the hydrant technology as you can see it's a single valve mount unit does not require an additional tubing does not require an additional pumps so, so there's no real maintenance. The only maintenance that needs to be done is to ensure that you regularly download so you don't lose data, and once in a while to regularly go take an oil sample and to make sure the reading is okay. Or you just wait till there's an alarm and then you go take a reading. You go take an oil sample and go get it measured at the laboratory or using a transport 10. Um, and typically, the lifespan of the sensor, because this is a question that's asked often, we see sensors last, lasting anywhere between 5 to 10 years and sometimes beyond 10 years. We have instruments in, in the field today that are even greater than 10 years, sensors. So if the instrument is run within a specified range of operating conditions, there's no reason as to why that sensor should not last more than five, 5 years. However, if it's brutalized and put in conditions and precautions are not taken, then the life expensity of the sensor will get shortened very quickly. So if you do have a special application, don't be shy, give us a call and we'll let you know the precautions to take. The one and most important precaution to take, use a heat fin adapter. By using a heat fin adapter, we extend the life of the sensor drastically. Again, there's no calibration required. All the calibration of the sensors are done at, at, the, at, at the factory. And if ever you have to replace a sensor, you'll get a new data sheet. Just put the new information in the CPO and you're ready to rock and roll. Again, the minute the, the unit is powered up and the valve is open, the, the unit starts to measure immediately. There is no waiting or learning period involved. So on that note, I leave you. And once again, thank you very much for listening to me. It was a pleasure uh, treating you all. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, that come to mind as the days go by, do not hesitate. Contact me, and it will be a pleasure for me to help you. Thank you once again. <laughs>